Raise your hand if you've ever felt inspired to challenge the status quo. <laughs> Expected that in this room. Either way, many of you have really seen an opportunity to change the system that we've been part of. Maybe it's in your community or even in the workplace. Similarly, we must find these opportunities to challenge many of the preconceived notions that we have on how we steward our planet so we can accelerate the pace of innovation needed to reverse climate change and marine degradation. And so when it comes to climate solutions, what we really see is this terrestrial bias where we're focused on leveraging less than 30% of the planet, land, to try to solve a global problem in climate change. The reality is, even if we planted one trillion trees, we would only be able to capture one third of the carbon that we've emitted to date. Despite being one of the planet's largest absorbers of heat and carbon, the oceans have largely been overlooked as an asset against climate change. Moving forward, the oceans have to be part of this equation if we are to see the true regeneration of our planet. Ocean impact is climate impact. And so what's reinforced this bias are what I call three overarching systemic barriers to ocean and climate impact. And that starts with funding, of course. Out of all of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, number 14, Life Below Water, is by far and away the least funded, at just 0.01% of all funding for the goals. Meanwhile, in the private sector, I can speak to this personally as a marine roboticist, we've really seen this domination by the defense and fossil fuel industries that was actually validated by the uh, Ocean 100 report that came out at the beginning of last year, profiling the top 100 companies making up the majority of the blue economy. No surprise, nine out of the top 10 were fossil fuel companies, and the overall majority of that 100 were fossil fuel and defense companies. And so lastly, that leads us to academia, where a lot of people have hope for really seeing the solution spin out for this work. And the reality is academia has perpetuated very limited siloed opportunities in research and public sector, missing this emerging blue economy, innovation and entrepreneurship, and ESG largely. And in fact, there are more degrees than there are opportunities to do the work in those spaces. And so from all these different sides, it's no wonder that the oceans have been undervalued as an asset against climate change. And more importantly, when we talk about solving things like sea level rise, climate change, and more, where are the accessible opportunities to do the work in the first place? And the reality is they rarely exist. And so these systemic barriers highlight a top-down approach that can best be put in context by a framework called the six conditions that hold systemic problems in place. The barriers I mentioned highlighted the siloed practices in not only minimal resource flows and funding, but also the limit, limited practices in exploitive fossil fuel work and defense. And of course, lastly, policy is usually a major focus as well, and moving notoriously slowly at that. And so altogether, this top-down approach obviously has not moved the needle fa far enough or fast enough. And we must systemically change our way of thinking and balance our approach if we are to drive the scale of innovation needed to really save our oceans and reverse climate change. We must equally approach planetary stewardship from the bottom up. And so to break down these barriers, the bottom up approach starts with challenging our own mental models of what it means to do ocean and climate impact work and the requirements to be part of it. The reality is you don't need a marine science degree or PhD to do this work. The future is interdisciplinary in this space. And so changing those mental models usually starts with community building, education, and inclusion, which is really just raising awareness, right? But that doesn't lead people to action, and that's truly why this middle level is so important. When you have access to catalytic relationships and connections, that gives you the confidence to take the leap into a new space. And that leap is really an opportunity to shift power dynamics. And so I founded Seaworthy Collective in Miami to not only build and educate the community for opportunities to do ocean and climate impact, but give them that opportunity through a mechanism that's called a venture studio. If you're not familiar with the venture studio, it's really a model along similar lines to incubators and accelerators, where we actually co-create startups building interdisciplinary teams from the ground up. That also allows us to democratize the opportunity for people to do ocean and climate impact work and really help start to shift those power dynamics in this space. And so as we think about what these opportunities can create, it's really unlocking this pipeline of talent and ideas that can drive forward the solutions and systems of solutions that we need to regenerate our planet. The more people that have that opportunity, the more ideas that we can get flowing that hopefully end up to scaling to really large scale impact. And so underlying all of this is a regenerative approach where we're not just focused on mitigating rooted in sustainability, but thinking bigger than siloed efforts and really building systems of solutions. And this is truly to solve problems at their roots and rebuild our ecosystems regionally. And so in the ocean space, we see this in six different impact areas. 
from biodiversity to greenhouse gas reduction removal, plastic reduction and removal, water quality improvement, building coast resilience, and measurement reporting and verification. But the key thing is, it's not just about each of these impacts individually, but how they come together to really magnify and amplify their total impact. And so, for example, from one of our first cohorts, we had Anya Freeman and James Layfield, who co-founded Kind Designs, who are 3D printing seawalls, living seawalls that can grow coral and algae and help regenerate the environment. And on the other side, you'll see Nicholas Key, who's a seaweed farmer in Jamaica, who's actually creating sustainable livelihoods by helping fisher folk who have actually lost jobs due to overfishing because they can't catch enough fish to support their families by regenerating the environment, by capturing carbon with seaweed. And so together, they have this capacity to not only build resilience, but also livelihoods and regenerate the environment together. And it's that magnification effect that's key. And so underlying all of this is a need to think bigger. It's not just about building community and solutions, but how we build ecosystems for innovation. And these innovation ecosystems happen at a regional scale. This regional development has really been limited by a need for instant gratification of supporting solutions and seeing direct return on investment. If we're thinking bigger about this, this global pipeline of ideas, it has to start with this ecosystem building mentality if we are to see the scale of innovation that we need. Only then will we be able to unlock these triple bottom line outcomes across social outcomes and making the field more accessible and inclusive, economic outcomes and creating regional economies, and of course, environmental regeneration. And so underlying all of this I mentioned is a, reg a regional approach. And what you see here is a map of global bioregions where, for example, we could plant seagrass and seaweed in South Florida and maybe in our neighboring Caribbean islands, but not up the coast in Maine, right? We'd have to plant kelp. And so it's this regional tailored approach that's really critical to creating the collective impact to regenerate our planet and utilize our oceans as an asset in that. At the end of the day, there is one definitive solution to saving our ocean and reversing climate change, people. The greatest barriers that we have to solving marine degradation and climate change aren't technical, but are barriers to opportunity for people and regions alike. When opportunities for changing the status quo are more accessible, we can mobilize the untapped talent and ideas needed to drive the scale of regional innovation to collectively regenerate our planet. So what can you do? Funders, think bigger. Stop going for the instant gratification and think about how you can create really this pipeline so that you get those later stage opportunities. If you're looking to jump into this space, apply for venture studios like ours, where you can co-create your own, own solution and really make a tangible impact. And even if you're not ready to take that leap, everyone has something to contribute, and being part of that community is critical. We need everyone on board. And so altogether, we need participation at all of these different levels if we're to truly overcome those systemic barriers to ocean and climate impact, and most importantly, co-create a regenerative blue economy for all from the bottom up. Thank you. Thank you.